tell you a little bit about what it shows uh, and then start the clip. The first 10 seconds will show you a living, swimming pteropod, one of these small animals that I spoke of earlier. It's a beautiful creature about the size of a lentil bean. It's incredibly important as a food source for juvenile salmon, for mackerel, for pollock, for herring. Uh, they are very, very abundant in oceans throughout the world. After that, you will see what happens to a pteropod in seawater that uh, is the same chemically as seawater that is projected by the end of the century. So let's start the video clip, if we could, please. And you will see first, um, once we get to it, <laughs> impacts of ocean acidification. This is a swimming pteropod, a sea butterfly, swimming through the ocean. It's a small shelled mollusk. This is the way it looks naturally. This is a pteropod shell that uh, you'll see time-lapse photos of what happens to the shell in uh, seawater uh, after 45 days uh, projected for the year 2100. And finally, this last clip is an animation illustrating from the year 1765 to 2100, the effect of increasing ocean acidity on the availability of the calcium carbonate mineral that pteropods, corals, and other organisms need to create their shells and skeletons. This is under a business as usual emission scenario, and the change in color from purple to blue to yellow to red indicates increasing ocean acidity and decreasing availability of the calcium carbonate that is needed for shells and skeletons. Ocean acidity has increased by 30% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution just over 200 years ago. This increase is 100 times faster than any change in acidity experienced by marine organisms for at least 20 million years. By the middle of the century, it's expected that coral calcification rates will decline by a third, and at that point, erosion of corals will outpace new growth, making many coral reefs unsustainable. And by the year 2100, vast areas of the ocean, ultimately shown here in red, will have reached levels of acidification where pteropods, corals, and other important marine species will likely be severely compromised. So in conclusion, our understanding of the impacts of ocean acidification is relatively new. Roughly two-thirds of the published research has come to light since 2004, which is why you probably haven't heard a lot about this issue. Thanks to Congress's action in passing the Federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act, more attention will be given to this subject, particularly by scientists at NOAA and our partners at the National Science Foundation and in academia. Nonetheless, our fundamental scientific understanding of the basic chemistry of ocean acidification is sound. More CO2 emitted into the atmosphere will increasingly lead to more CO2 being absorbed by oceans. That will make oceans more acidic. And we are now beginning to understand the ocean's very capacity to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere is being degraded by ocean acidification. These mechanisms can only be addressed by decreasing the amount of CO2 that enters the atmosphere. The dramatic impacts that ocean acidification can and will have on marine ecosystems are clear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh Dr. Lipchenko, uh, very much. Um, and I think you all brought us back to our sophomore and junior years in high school with some of these <laughs> elemental explanations of how our planet uh, works. And, uh, and I think to a very large extent, you explained to us why uh, just about everyone under the age of 25 wants us to do something about this problem because they're recently been in science classes in high schools, grammar schools, colleges all across the country. So they might be a little bit more familiar with this than uh, people who are a little bit older, but I think that's why we call them the green generation, because they're reflecting the science that is being taught them today across our country and across the planet. So let me begin by uh, um, recognizing myself for a round of questions, and I'll begin with you, Dr. Holdren. Um, reconstruction of uh, global temperatures over the last millennium show a dramatic rise over the course of this century. Uh, that has produced the so-called uh, hockey stick graph, which uh, is being questioned in some um, 
uh, circles. Uh, can you clarify for us the evidence uh, that supports the significant rise in temperatures over the past century? Sure. When one talks about reconstruction of past temperatures, one is talking about using a variety of indicators of what the temperature of the Earth was in the period before we had adequate thermometer measurements to meaningfully determine the average surface temperature of the Earth. Those methods include the analysis of bubbles in ice cores, analysis of tree rings, of fossil pollens, of sediments, uh, and a variety of other so-called paleoclimatological indicators. The hockey stick uh, metaphor came about when an analysis of the last 1,000-plus uh, years of temperature based on a variety of reconstructions available at that time from these different proxies, the ice cores, the tree rings, uh, the sediments, the fossil pollens, and so on, came out with uh, a temperature trace that with some bumps was relatively flat for most of the last thousand years and then rose rather sharply in the 20th century, indeed then extremely sharply. So the thing had the shape of a hockey stick, a long, f relatively flat section and then a steep rise. This was the particular graphic that led to a considerable amount of controversy at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s as to whether the particular approaches to developing that graph used by the group of scientists who did it and published it in the journal Nature in 1998 were absolutely correct. There was a flurry of activity at that time, a flurry of controversy about whether their statistical methods were right, whether they had used the right proxies, whether they had interpreted them correctly. It's important to understand that there were a variety of other uh, research groups around the world doing proxy analyses and getting uh, similar results. Uh, with some variations, because proxies are difficult to interpret. The different proxy measures dip typically relate to different specific areas in the world where the proxy indicators have been preserved, and you need to merge them together in a way that ultimately makes sense and is scientifically rigorous, and that's very challenging. But in the end, as I mentioned before, the effective resolution of the controversy was when the National Academy of Sciences conducted a major study looking at all the proxy data sets, all the methods that had been used to interpret them, their results published uh, in 2006 led to the conclusion which I mentioned before. In fact, it was even a little stronger than the conclusion I mentioned before. They said it was highly likely that the uh, temperature increase of the 20th century was unprecedented in the last 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. There was some greater degree of bumpiness in some of the proxy uh, records than the 1998 Nature publication had included. So it was kind of a, a, a warped hockey stick, but still a hockey stick. Thank you, Dr. Holden. And uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lubchenco, um, there's been a uh, uh, kind of a series of uh, stories going around making the rounds that the planet is actually not warming but cooling, and that uh, evidence over the past decade indicates that we're in a cooling period and not in a warming period, historically. Uh, what would your response to that be? If you look carefully at the uh, climate records, uh, the, the warming that has occurred is not gradual. It's jerky. And you get periods of time uh, where there are steep increases and other times where it's relatively flat, other times where there are slight dips. And the key point here, I think, is to really understand global trends. You need to look at long enough periods of time that you get a clear signal. Uh, it is quite possible to have a decade in which you see very little change. But if you look at the entire century, you see some remarkable changes. And in fact, uh, if I could have the, the slide that I brought, um, I was hoping someone would ask this question. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, for doing so. Um, and <clears throat> what you will see on this slide uh, are the actual temperature data uh, from, if it will boot, <laughs> from, uh, thank you. Uh, you see here um, on the far right uh, data uh, from the last uh, decade, uh, whoops, that's not what it was supposed to do. Can we do that again? <laughs> okay, so what I wanted to do, yep, okay, so let's just do, yeah, okay, stop right there. Uh, can you go back one, go, go up, nope, 
there you go. Okay. So this is the most recent data trend. And if you take just that period of time, there is no discernible, no obvious trend in that. Um, if you then go uh, and ha add, take longer uh, interval of time, next one please, and keep going back through time, you see more and more uh, information that gives you a better sense of what the actual real overall trend is. And so in that entire uh, record, it is possible to have some ups and some downs. The point is that the overall record is an upward trajectory. Thank you, Dr. Lipchenko, very much. My time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to go back to the emails that uh, ended up being placed in the public record. And I don't want to get to whether or not they were legally placed in the public record. The question is whether or not they were accurate. Because if they were accurate, it's profoundly disturbing. And it does end up putting into question all of the science of climate change. Now, uh, the data from the Climate Research Unit at the UEA in England is one of only three major data sets, but they considerably overlap. And they've been used as a basis for the IPCC report, as well as the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And that means that these two booklets that were passed out this morning, you know, at best need to have a thorough review in the light of this information that has been disclosed. And at worst, it's junk science, and it is a part of a massive international scientific fraud. Now, Dr. Holden, you've been in the middle of a lot of this, and I've got a couple of questions based upon your statements before you joined the Obama administration. Um, you gave an interview in August of 2006 with BBC News in the UK. And you said that a sea level rise of up to 13 feet was in the realm of possibility. However, that's 11 feet higher than what the IPPC has estimated uh, over this period of time, which is uh, somewhere between 7 and 23 inches. Now, with respect to the hockey stick theory, which the chairman has referred to, um, that's been pretty much discredited uh, uh, in the scientific community. And yet, in your October 13th email, which is now in the public record, you aggressively attacked uh, the two scientists that uh, put this together, uh, a Dr. Willie Soon and a Dr. Sally Baliunas, uh, uh, for that. Now, uh, I think it's pretty clear that in both cases you were wrong. Uh, and I guess I'd like to know if you're concerned now that you're in the White House and representing all of the public, uh, whether you're concerned about the misrepresentation of the state of science with respect to global warming. And I'd also like to know if you still support uh, the principal critic of the, uh, those who trash the uh, hockey stick theory. Uh, and that is a doctor, Michael Mann, knowing of his efforts now to hide his data and to encourage his colleagues to shut out journals like Climate Research to publish works contrary to his own bias. Uh, Congressman, let me try to take those um, in, the, in the order you asked them. Uh, and, and the very first part of your statement, uh, with respect, I would disagree with you that this uh, current uproar calls into question all of climate science. I do not believe that it remotely Well, sir, I didn't that. say that. I said it ought to be looked at again. And, you know, uh, well, there is increasing evidence of scientific fascism that is going on. And I think as policymakers who are making decisions about the state of the American economy for the next several generations, that we ought to have accurate science. And it appears there is enough question on whether the science we have is accurate. That has got to be resolved. And I wish we could have done it in this hearing, but the chairman would not let us. But go ahead. Um, I, I very much agree that we need to resolve uh, the current issue. It is important to understand uh, what has really gone on here, to get to the bottom of it. Uh, as I indicated before, that has been one of the strengths of science over the years, the capacity to get to the bottom of the controversies that emerge. And I believe we will get to the bottom of this one. But the key point is, however this particular controversy comes out, uh, the result will not call into question the bulk of our understanding of how the climate works or how humans uh, are affecting it. 
Uh, you mentioned um, an interview of mine uh, a few years ago in which I talked about the possibility of a sea level rise in this century as much as 13 feet. That was based on scientific peer-reviewed publications that appeared in the early 2000s that indicated that over geologic time in periods of natural climate change, there had been episodes in which the rate of sea level rise increased by as much as two to five meters per century, and that this could not be ruled out at the temperatures for which we were heading in the 21st century as a result of our you're, activities. You are still 11 now, feet above what the IPPC, well, that, IPCC sir, was recommending. If, if my, you time, will, my time is almost up, and I just like to you know, say that there, there's an awful lot of scientific McCarthyism, meaning name calling, going on. Because I quote from your email of October 13, 2003, saying, doing this will reveal that Soon and Bali Yunus are essentially amateurs in the interpretation of historical and paleoclimatology records of climate change. You know, you're, you're not dealing with their issue, you're calling them names. And I think we ought to get to the bottom of this without having the name calling. And I wish that, uh, that you, as the President's science advisor and a former employee of one of the most distinguished universities in the world, would be able to get beyond the name calling and get to it. My time is up and I yield back. I, I would be happy to answer all of the Congressman's questions if I'm allowed. Uh, I, 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 we, 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 you will be given enough time, but uh, let me turn right now and recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. It is continuing studying to me that people can sit and watch the evidence before their eyes of what the seas are going to look like in a century that might melt pteropods and somehow blow that off and be more interested in emails from London. It's interesting to me. And the only way I've been able to understand it is that some people believe there's a massive global conspiracy that's intent on world domination associated with phonying up information about pteropods and the fact that the Arctic is melting. So I just want to ask you if you're part of that m massive international conspiracy. Are either one of you members of the Trilateral Commission, Spectre, or Chaos? <laughs> I just need an answer. Co Congressman Inslee, I am not a member of any of those organizations, and I do not believe that there is a conspiracy. It would be an amazing thing indeed if the academies of science of virtually every country in the world that had one, and if the Earth and Planetary Sciences departments in every m major university that had one around the world. We're all engaged together with the United Nations Environment Program, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and all the other bodies that have reviewed this matter in a conspiracy. That really defies uh, imagination that the great bulk of the scientific community all around the world looking at these matters has come to the same conclusion. Well, I'll just tell you how I look at this. The National Academy of Sciences, uh, has looked at this with, in great detail, in great summary, from a wide variety of data sets, not just from the individuals who wrote the emails, but in fact from a wide variety of data sets, including information generated by NASA and NOAA and a whole host of United States agencies. And they concluded that in fact both there are changes in the atmospheric climate and that there is increasing acidification, or at least NOAA has, associated with CO2. In, be that, if that is true, isn't it fair to categorize uh, as much as we want to get people to use the right language in their emails that as this is a, a tempest in the teapot coming out of England? Isn't that a right characterization of this? Well, I think we need to wait to, until all the facts are in to find out uh, exactly what some of these emails mean in terms of how the scientists in question uh, behaved. Uh, I mean, I would, I would point out that scientists are human, and from time to time they experience frustration, anger, um, resentment, uh, and from time to time they display defensiveness and bias uh, and even misbehavior of some kind. So like any other group of human beings, they're subject to human frailties. Uh, I think the facts are not entirely in on this particular case as to how much and what kinds of frailty might have been displayed here. But the key point is that when we get to the bottom of it, no matter how it comes out, the great bulk of the data on which our understanding of the climate system rests will not have been affected. And our basic understanding of where we are, where we're headed, and by how much we would need to change course to avoid really unfortunate consequences will not have changed. And is that, 
let me ask you, is there anything about these emails that affect ocean acidification at all, uh, Dr. Lubchenco? Congressman, I haven't read all of the emails, but I've seen nothing uh, in them, uh, in those that I have read, about ocean acidification. It really is not an area that uh, is something that that particular research group was focused on. And in my view, the emails really um, do nothing to undermine the very strong scientific consensus and the independent scientific analyses of thousands of scientists around the world uh, that tell us that uh, the Earth is warming. Uh, and that the warming is largely a result of uh, human activities. So let me, if I can, uh, I, I have some concerns about the state of our science that are reflected in the fact that everything that I'm reading suggests that the predictions were not, were not sufficiently dire as to what we're experiencing. Now, I am not a scientist as you are. But it seems to me the evidence that I am seeing coming in, I'm looking at this Copenhagen Diagnosis Report I made reference to in my opening statement, that the Arctic ice sheets are melting much more fast in the summer than we anticipated, that there's been a 40 percent greater than average um, uh, ice sheet melt than predicted in the IPCC report in 2007, um, excuse me, 2006, that we've seen an increasing rate in sea rise than, than was expected. And to me, just my lay approach is the evidence seems to be coming in in the last 24 months, either on the direst end of the spectrum that was considered or outside of that spectrum. What, what, is that a fair characterization of a, a, a huge data set, or, or what, what are we to make of this? Well, well let me, uh, Congressman, uh, take the opportunity of this particular question to answer part of Congressman Sensenbrenner's because he referred to the IPCC's finding in its fourth assessment report uh, about sea level rise. In that report, the IPCC made clear that they were only considering the thermal expansion of seawater and a small contribution from the melting of mountain glaciers in their sea level rise estimate for the 21st century, leaving out deliberately the mechanisms thought to have caused the more rapid rises in sea level that have occurred from time to time in the geologic past. And the reason they left out those mechanisms that are capable of causing more rapid sea level rises, they explained in their report, was that we do not yet understand those mechanisms well enough to model them and arrive at the sort of quantitative conclusion that the IPCC was emphasizing. And in addition, we didn't know at that time, we didn't have enough data to know whether on balance the Antarctic ice sheet, the larger of the two, was gaining mass or losing mass. Since that IPCC report, there has been a great deal of additional work on these questions. We now know that both the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheet are losing mass. We know that the rate of sea level rise today is more than twice the rate of sea level rise averaged over the 20th century. And the current best estimates of the peak sea level rise to be expected in this century are one to two meters. That's not as high as my number from 2006. The uh, advancing science has ruled out the high end of that range, but it makes me wrong in 2006 by about a factor of two. And it makes the IPCC wrong by a much larger factor, by which their numerical estimate understated the possible rise of sea level in the century we're now in. Doctor? Congressman, let me just add to that that uh, the scientific um, assessment process that the IPCC uses uh, or that National Academy of Sciences uses are inherently conservative. Uh, and scientists are, uh, by and large, fairly reluctant to make statements that they can't back up without good data. And so, and I think the sea level rise example is a classic case in point. Scientists knew when they were projecting a 23 inch sea rise uh, increase by the end of the century that there were important factors that they couldn't account for, but they, but they w couldn't include them because they, couldn't, they didn't understand them well enough. And so they erred on the side of caution. And I think we see this over and over in many of the IPCC conclusions. They are inherently conservative. And so when the reality uh, plays out, it's sometimes more than what was predicted because of that uh, need to have uh, agreement and, and levels of certainty. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I've listened very closely. I think it's all very interesting listening to you all and some of the other questions as well from uh, members of the panel here. I'm not a scientist, but I don't question that the Earth climate is changing. Uh, you know, we used to have dinosaurs, and uh, there's still a lot of debate about what happened to the dinosaurs. Then we had the Ice Age. There was a lot of debate about what happened during the Ice Age. Um, I was noticing an article in our uh, one of our papers just the other day. They were they're doing some studies in Lake Superior along the Pitchard Rocks, uh, which they are uh, indicating that they think uh, a couple of thousand years ago the water levels there could be uh, anywhere as much as 50 or 60 feet higher than they are currently. Uh, so the climate of the world is never static. It is never going to be static. The climate is going to change. And, and for me, the question is, as you say, the science is, uh, you, I'm paraphrasing what uh, Dr. Lubachenko uh, said, that the science is incontrovertible, that um, it's unequivocal, that it is all, that the climate change is human-induced or human-produced. And that is the question that I'm struggling with. That's why I think all of these emails coming out uh, are, are very interesting. I think it's unfortunate that anybody that questions the ideology, the absolute science that man is creating all of this uh, is somehow, we don't care about the planet. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And it, I think it is, uh, it is unfortunate that uh, uh, that happens, but uh, whatever. I do think that um, the question, as I say for me, is whether or not it is human-induced particularly when uh, this Congress has been traveling down a path with cap-and-trade legislation that is going to, in my opinion, decimate the American economy and that of my state. I think that we look at these emails and, and you know, as it's an attempt in many cases just to silence any dissent, which I think is very unfortunate. And I would just read one. I'm not sure the ranking member read this previously, but here is one. Uh, you know, there weren't emails during the dinosaur age, by the way, either, or the ice age, but here's an email saying, I think we need to stop considering the Climate Research Journal as a legitimate peer-reviewed journal, and perhaps we should encourage our colleagues in the climate research community to no longer submit to or cite papers in this journal. How ridiculous, how unfortunate that here's this climate research journal that if they question the incontrovertible science, that they are, you know, just dismissed and uh, and made to uh, feel as though, you know, it's, it's, they can't even question this. I think it's a travesty. And I do recognize that the emails are an inconvenient truth, perhaps, are a uh, an embarrassment, particularly on the uh, uh, on on the brink of Copenhagen. But I think one of the most important jobs of the Congress is to exercise its oversight responsibilities. And because of these emails, because, in my opinion, there is at least a debate, a debate on whether or not climate change is human-induced or man-produced. For instance, I was just reading the other day that in Indonesia, where the peat moss is naturally um, composting, that that is the third largest producer of carbon dioxide in the planet more so than many other kinds of things. I'm not sure how our cap and trade legislation is going to address that. Uh, but, you know, that's why I say the climate is never going to be static. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I guess I would just use my time here again to ask that this committee consider a hearing into this uh, climate gate debate that is exploding around us. And I would also ask that Dr. Holdren, who made a comment, uh, you said that you thought that the uproar should be resolved, and I guess I would just ask you, how? Do you think we could do that without completely being dismissive of anyone that would ask such a question in light of all these emails? And, and how would you think it could be resolved with the best transparency and with the interest of the American uh, people in our economy, uh, certainly at, uh, at heart? 
Uh, absolutely, I think it can be resolved, and I think it can be resolved without name calling and without being dismissive. Uh, there actually, uh, notwithstanding occasional exceptions, is a long history of respectful and civil debate among scientists who have uh, differing views on many of the de details of virtually any issue. In this particular case, uh, one already sees uh, a very substantial amount of activity of scientists. Uh, who are going to be looking at these data, who are going to be looking at to try to understand what the emails are really saying, who are going to uh, re-examine the questions that uh, were at issue then. Uh, I think there's no question that this will happen whether or not this committee or any other holds a hearing on the subject. That's the way the science community works. When results are called into question, uh, scientists flock to the scene, as it were, in order to figure out uh, what was really going on there and what the best uh, approximation to the truth we can get at at the current state of understanding is. And that is constantly changing. One needs to understand that as new information becomes available, anybody who is a good scientist looks at the new information in the context of the old information and tries to develop a better picture of what's happening. I believe that that will happen here. Congresswoman, may I offer a comment? Certainly. Uh, could I draw your attention to page six of this document? Um, there is a figure here that I think addresses uh, the very important question that you asked earlier, and that is, uh, what is the role of, what's the human contribution to global climate change, and how do we know if humans are having an influence? You're absolutely correct that climate has changed a lot in the past. We've got good evidence of that. Uh, we have been able to model those changes and understand more through time about what the natural changes are uh, and what factors are influencing them. This particular figure shows what the climate would be doing without the additional carbon dioxide that humans have put into the atmosphere along with other greenhouse gases. And that's what's shown in this blue, uh, the dark blue band. Uh, this is uh, 1900 to 2000. If, if I could, I know my time has expired. Let me just ask you, does that graph take into consideration what is happening in Indonesia? And do you consider what is happening in Indonesia man-induced? There are many sources of carbon dioxide, some of which are natural and some of which are a result of changes in land use practices, so they are uh, affected by human activities, as well as burning of fossil fuels. Uh, and these kinds of analyses take into account our current understanding of the sum total of emissions from multiple sources, and they tease apart what's, what is the human contribution from what would be happening naturally. And there's clear evidence that what is happening now is strongly influenced by uh, human activities. I'm not sure if that was a yes or no, but my time is uh, completed. Thank you very much. Uh, General Lady's time has expired. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here. I was going to ask first about the emails, too. Um, do you think the, the scandal and this, this seems to be a culture of corruption in the scientific community right now on these emails and manipulation of data uh, for a purpose for, to get their own results, do you see that as a problem, yes or no? Congressman, I don't believe that the exchanges that you saw are typical of the broader scientific community. Uh, I would add that, that I, too, do not believe that these emails uh, are remotely sufficient to demonstrate a culture of corruption in the scientific community. They are emails from a relatively few people involved in a particular controversy that was attended by a good deal of frustration and anger. And uh, as to exactly what uh, went on in the way of uh, manipulation uh, of data, I think that remains to be seen. Uh, to the extent that there was manipulation of data that was not scientifically legitimate, and I emphasize that scientists manipulate data all the time in order to make them uh, comprehensible and consistent. But if there was manipulation of data that was not scientifically legitimate, yes, I regard that as a problem and I would uh, denounce it. And I think, uh, again, that the merit of the scientific system is that over time it tends uh, successfully to unearth those kinds of instances, to unmask them, and to correct them. 
and that's what I assume will happen here. Well, since we do know now that some people are manipulating data and have perverted, trying to pervert the system or this uh, final analysis, uh, would you would, do we both support a, an independent investigation into this? I'm not sure an independent investigation, if you mean by the Congress of the United States, is the right way to get at uh, scientific truth. I think the scientific community has well-established mechanisms for doing that, and I believe they've already been set in motion by, uh, by these disclosures. Uh, we will find out uh, what went on there. It's not clear at this point. I haven't read all the emails either. It's not clear at this point what some of them mean. I would point out, for example, that the term trick is often used in science to describe a clever way to get around a difficulty that is perfectly legitimate. The use of the word trick does not in itself, in science, demonstrate that there was manipulation. I think we need to hear all sides of the story before we decide what happened there. If it turns out there was improper uh, manipulation, again, I would denounce it and I would be grateful that the scientific process had run its course and disclosed it. If this committee or others want to have hearings that uh, end up calling as witnesses people, scientists, who are involved in trying to sort that out, I think, of course, that's fine. Uh, now, both of you are, are, are scientists. Um, what, what is the, we were talking about man-made and, and natural causes of CO2. If you could just really quickly simply break down how much is man-made and how much is natural, percentage-wise? Well, first, first of all, what you need to understand is the natural flows of carbon dioxide in and out of the atmosphere, out of the atmosphere by photosynthesis and absorption in the oceans, back into the atmosphere from outgassing from the oceans and by the decomposition uh, or combustion of organic matter have largely been in balance for a long time. They're currently in the range of something like seven or eight times the human input, but the problem is that the natural input and uptake has been in balance and the human input has driven the system out of balance and is leading to a, an accumulation of additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is extremely well understood scientifically. But nobody, least, nobody disputes this particular point in science. But it's at least seven or eight times greater than the man-made cause. Yes, but it's in balance. It's in and right. out. And so, so the fact so that the flows are bigger so here's does what I'm not... Uh, sea creatures and everything, it says that, that the ocean absorbs approximately 25 percent of the CO2 added to the atmosphere from human activity each year. So if it's seven or eight times more is naturally caused, if you eliminate the human beings from the earth and all human activity, would, would ocean acidic, acidification still occur? It wouldn't? It would for the time required to take the excess out of the atmosphere that is accumulated there. In other words, the, the oceans are not yet in equilibrium with what we have done to the atmosphere, but they will get there. Asking. Congressman, I think what you're asking is um, if humans were not put Putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, wouldn't the oceans already be absorbing some? And the answer is yes, but they would also be using some of the carbon dioxide and it would be in balance. But What's it, different it, now is that humans have contributed now about 30 percent of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, and some of that has been taken up by oceans, making them more acidic. But isn't the ocean one of the biggest emitters? The oceans and the land both release CO2 and take it up. And that process that? has been in balance over millennia, and that continues. What's happening is that humans are adding more to the atmosphere and more to the oceans. So there's a, the, the total amount of CO2, it, it, it's being redistributed because of our activities. So if, if 97, 96 percent of the emissions are natural, and 4 percent are man-made. We have a responsibility for that 4 percent. But even if we eliminated it, isn't it a little arrogant to think that we could manipulate the entire process? We have manipulated the entire process. That, I think that's the point. Oh, I know you have on the numbers and stuff. And, and we've, we've, <laughs> we've, we've, we've driven it out of balance. Have you, you've said that you guys can make any data, anything. I know that. I see it. My opponents with polling data and stuff. I know how that works. But um, 
The, uh, the, these are not data that somebody have pulled out of the air or out of their heads. Fish they're will measurements. Move, move to warm spots, and they're moving. Uh, I, I see in the Atlantic. You said the fish are moving. Yes, sir. Okay. Don't they always move to a warmer spot? What's changing in the oceans is uh, where it's warm. Uh, doesn't that ch it does change. I mean, uh, many fish move. Uh, most fish and many other species stay in the type of water um, in which their physiological performance is the best. What we're seeing now is that because oceans are warming overall, um, the places, if, if you look at a place on the coastline, for example, in California, the places that used to be a certain temperature are now warmer, and so species that used to live there are moving northward to stay in the temperature zone that they would have been in previously. So species are moving in response to the changing distribution of heat in the ocean. And Doctor, you, you, you said in your testimony that, that I, or you stated Time. before that sea levels, okay, well, oh, thank you. You can, you can complete your question if you'd like. Oh. At sea levels, you, 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 uh, with the data you've interpreted, um, will rise 11 feet by the year 2000? Uh, no, I did not say that. I said that was a possible outcome, an upper limit on the amount of sea level rise based on understanding of the processes that was available at the time. It is now uh, considered that the upper limit on sea level rise in this century is about two meters or a little over six feet. And that's what I now say because that's what the current science says. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, six feet does sound like a very large increase in the, <clears throat> in the water levels of the planet. Uh, the gentlelady from uh, Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of each of you for submitting your testimony in advance. We have had multiple hearings this morning for the Energy and Commerce Committee, so I've been upstairs in a mammogram uh, hearing over the controversy that came there, and I do have a statement, Mr. Chairman, that I'll submit for the record. And um, be, without objection, it will be included. Since I didn't have that, I'll just take all of my time and questions. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, Dr. Holdren, I wanted to talk with you. I was delighted that you were here. Uh, some of the emails that have come out recently uh, from CRU indicate some animosity, uh, I guess would be the best way to describe it, in research uh, or for the medieval warm period, uh, the research by Dr. Soon. And I wanted to see if you would elaborate on your intentions in those emails. The great bulk of uh, scientists who've looked at these questions uh, concluded a long time ago that the medieval warm period was uh, a regional phenomenon and not a global phenomenon. The arguments by uh, Soon and Balayunas uh, to the contrary fared very badly in the scientific community in terms of the uh, rigor and validity of their arguments. And uh, that is the reason that they were often uh, disparaged in discussions of this matter, in particular because they continued to espouse the view that the uh, medieval warming period was a global phenomenon long after evidence to the contrary became persuasive to everyone else. One of the characteristics one expects of scientists is to change their mind when data and analysis show that they were wrong the first time. Um, I changed my mind about the maximum sea level possible in the 21st century when the analysis and the data changed. Uh, and that's what we expect from others. When that doesn't happen, a degree of frustration and anger often materializes because of a concern that people are simply muddying the water by repeating discredited hypotheses. Okay. Well, let's apply that statement then, uh, looking at the climate change data that has been lost. And do you think that the climate change data has uh, been compromised uh, since there was original data lost by CRU? 
Yeah, I think that's unfortunate. Whenever any original data are lost, that is a misfortune. It's, it's uh, unfortunate that it happened. Uh, I wish it had been prevented. Uh, I think the robustness of all of the data sets we have available to us is sufficient to survive that loss, but I do regret the loss. Well, if, the, if further review on all of this shows that the IPCC report in 2007 used corrupted or tainted data, what do you think they ought to do about it? Should they be willing to go back and say, you know, uh, we're going to have to change our mind on this because we used corrupted data or we didn't give the whole uh, picture or science? If you look at the whole thing, it, it proves us wrong. To the extent that it has shown that data were corrupted and influenced conclusions of the IPCC, of course those conclusions should be revised. And the IPCC in every successive report that it produces which is roughly every five years, revises a whole variety of conclusions it reached in the previous uh, assessment because new information has become available. It's, of course, unfortunate if the new information that becomes available is that data that were previously used were corrupted. But in terms of the outcome, the revision of the findings based on new information is the same. Scientists do that all the time. The IPCC does it. And they will do it if it is uh, determined that any uh, conclusion of the IPCC was based on data that were corrupted, you can be sure that those conclusions will be revised in the next assessment. We've done some hearings. I think it was in 05. We did some hearings uh, in Energy and Commerce Committee on the hockey stick theory and Dr. Mann's uh, hockey stick theory. And I know Dr. Wegman and the National Academy of Sciences have uh, made comments that Dr. Mann didn't use proper statistical methods in his research on that. What's your opinion there? I think there is reason to believe that some of the statistical methods uh, that Dr. Mann used uh, were not the best for the purpose. Uh, the Academy pointed that out, and it nonetheless concluded that his, uh, that his basic uh, finding that the last 50 years were the warmest half century uh, in the last uh, one to 2,000 years uh, was nonetheless robust. And again, I would point out that arguments about what the best statistical techniques to use are uh, pervasive in the scientific community. And uh, it's no surprise that one has a difference of opinion. It's no surprise that a scientist may have made a mistake in the method chosen to analyze a particular data set. Again, the key thing about science is not that scientists are always right. It's that they fix their mistakes over time. Well, let me ask you this. I know that um, some of the scientists who uh, have come before us and they advocate limiting greenhouse gas emissions also have stated they think that maybe they have the global temperatures have stopped rising over the past 10 years, even though the greenhouse gas emissions have increased. So how, how do you go about explaining that discrepancy when you look at what is natural, what is man-made, what is cyclical? Uh, how, how do you explain that? Uh, well, first of all, I think, Congressman, before, Congresswoman, before you came in, Dr. Lubchenco explained a diagram that's, that's on the board that actually addresses that question. And the key point is that the climate and the surface temperature of the Earth fluctuates all the time for a wide variety of reasons, uh, most of them natural. Uh, what we are seeing is superimposed on those natural fluctuations a long-term trend of increasing global average surface temperature of the magnitude and of the sort expected to result according to both theory and models from the increases in carbon dioxide and other heat-trapping substances that humans have imposed on the atmosphere. If you look at the actual temperature data, and I have in front of me the uh, NOAA data set for the global average surface temperatures through 2008, what you see is that nine of the 10 warmest years in the 140-year thermometer record, the period of time since 1880 when we've had enough thermometer measurements around the land and the ocean to meaningfully define a global average surface temperature, nine of the 10 warmest years in that period occurred since 1998. Uh, 1998 itself was the second warmest year in the record. 2005 was the first warmest. All 15 of the warmest years in the 140-year record occurred since 1990. 
uh, you look at the numbers, you do see a bump, as you see up there uh, on the screen in the far right, where uh, in the last few years there is no discernible upward trend. But this is completely consistent with having natural fluctuations, natural ups and downs, superimposed on a long-term warming trend associated with greenhouse gases. Mr. Chairman, can I time has expired. one other part on the question? We will have a second round. We'll the general lady round. went eight minutes on the eight minutes and 15 Thank seconds. Chair. The chair recognizes the um, gentleman from uh, Washington State. Dr. Holden, you have testified several times listening to you that uh, given the extensive review by the National Academy of Science and using information based from NOAA, NASA, and a whole host of other, of other data sets, that there is no reason to uh, revise their fundamental conclusion that humans are contributing to change in climate and NOAA not to change a fundamental conclusion that the oceans are becoming more acidic. Mr. Sensenbrenner suggested that there is some scientific fascism, and that is a quote, is there any evidence of fascism in the NASA organization, of scientific fascism associated with this? I'm not even sure exactly what that term would mean, but I, I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, cabals, conspiracies, uh, misbehavior in uh, the characterization and use of data in NASA or NOAA. Well, I tell you, it, it's troublesome to me. The people who put the men on the moon, the people who discovered water on, on the moon, the people who are doing great research, figuring out how the oceans are becoming acidic, some of whom are my constituents, it's disturbing to me that people would come to, to this chamber and call them fascists. I got to tell you, I got a problem with that. I don't think that's right. These men and women are doing the best they can to provide us data and conclusions to the best of their ability. And they, through their professional work, have reached a very, very strong consensus on these scientific issues who are working for Uncle Sam. And I think it's wrong to say that about them. And there's a little emotion in my voice because I've seen in my neighborhood what this phenomenon is doing. I'd like to be able to catch salmon and my grandkids, who celebrated his first birthday Sunday, to catch salmon that live on pteropods maybe 50 or 60 years from now. And when people watch what I watched and say that this is just big, a big scientific fascist conspiracy that are ginning this stuff up, I got a problem with that. I'll just ask you, uh, Dr. Luchemko, I, uh, I was at a pier in Seattle about six months ago and a NOAA ship docked and it had a bunch of NOAA scientists on it who were discovering the, uh, investigating the, the rate of acidification off the Pacific coast. And when they were explaining to me their findings, their jaws were kind of agape because what they told me is that the rate of acidification was stunning to them, particularly in the shallow waters off our Pacific coast. They explained to me that, as I understand this correctly, the waters are more acidic the lower in the water column they have been, but now very acidic levels are becoming very close within 150, 200 feet of the surface. And this was shocking to them. And the only explanation they had was that CO2 is going into the atmosphere and disturbing the equilibrium of this process that's been going on for eons. Could you tell us about what your, what your information is about that? Mr. Congressman, I think the rate uh, of change in ocean uh, acidification has surprised many people. Uh, and uh, it is absolutely the case that uh, off the west coast of the United States, where winds blow along the coastline and push the surface waters away from the coast, which pulls up cold, nutrient-rich, low oxygen and lower pH water to the surface, that that's where we are seeing some of the greatest uh, increases in acidity uh, happening uh, around the world. And it is of deep concern because those areas, as you well know, are historically very, very rich. Our wonderful productive fisheries off that area so are in large part a consequence of this upwelling. I appreciate that. I want to ask, is there anybody in this room, including the two witnesses and my Republican colleagues and my Democratic colleague, is there anybody in this room who has information to suggest that the oceans are not becoming more acidic? Has anybody got information like that? Anybody? Has anybody got an explanation why the oceans are becoming more acidic, other than the fact 
that there's massive amounts of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. Has anybody got an explanation for that? I haven't heard any. And yet people are trying to gin up this controversy because you know why? It's not because they're not intelligent. It's because they're afraid that we can't solve this problem. And I think if we had a little more confidence in ourselves and our ability to solve this problem, we would open our minds to the scientific information that is becoming available to us. And this idea of equilibrium, I'll just try one more. I don't know why it's so hard for people to understand the idea of equilibrium. To me, it's like this. Is this a fair metaphor? A guy goes to the doctor. He says, the doctor, I've gained 10 pounds. Well, have you changed your behavior at all? Yes, I've started eating a huge banana split at lunch and dinner every single day. And he goes, well, it's obviously you've been eating more food. And he goes, no, no, it's not the banana split. Look at all the other food I've, I've eaten. It's the other stuff I've, that's 85% of my caloric intake. That's 85% of the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere. Don't look at the banana split. Don't look at the coal-fired plants. Don't look at the cars. Is that kind of a metaphor for what we're facing here? Not bad, huh, for an, for an, for an amateur. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do appreciate Mr. Inslee's metaphors, but let me say that the controversy over the leaked emails and their uh, contents cannot be ignored because it goes to the very basis upon which this debate has gone on for the last several years. And I see an awful lot of attempts by people in this room to shove that concern under the rug. I'm telling you now, it will get worse rather than getting better. And I'll define what I mean by scientific fascism. These emails trash the scientific conclusions by those who have disputed Dr. Mann's hockey stick theory. There are information in the emails that the publication Climate Research in which they were published ought to be boycotted because they weren't doing the politically correct thing. And I understand that the editor of Climate Research ended up getting fired as a result. Now there is intimidation in the scientific community by people who wish to be contrary to what the conventional wisdom is. And we are being asked as a Congress to make major changes in American society and energy use and on how much the out-of-pocket cost is to every person in this country uh, as a result of this debate. And we in Congress better get it right. The scientists may be able to change their story and do more research on it, but once Congress passes a law, it will be as difficult to repeal the consequences of that law as putting milk back into the cow. And we know all about cows in Wisconsin. Now, the denial has not stopped because six weeks ago, on uh, October 27th, Michael Mann wrote an email that says, in part, as we all know, this isn't about truth at all. It's about plausibly deniable accusations. We need to know the truth here before we can legislate in the name of the American people. Now, Dr. Holden, given the fact that you were involved in the email traffic that uh, has been released from the University of East Anglia uh, in England in the discrediting of the soon, the soon and uh, I'm mispronouncing uh, uh, Balayunas uh, study on the hockey stick theory, and it's been considerably discredited. How can you be objective on this when you're testifying before Congress, advising the President and speaking the Ameri to the American public? Uh, f first of all, Congressman Sensenbrenner, let me, let me say that, that science is rough. Scientists are brutal in criticism. Anybody who's ever taken a doctoral exam uh, in natural science uh, understands that very well. Uh, so there's nothing unusual about uh, strong language in criticizing results of others that one has concluded are deeply wrong. The, uh, but you are defending the results of others that have since been well, proven right. Let, 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 let me uh, finish answering the question, How if, can I, you be objective? If, if I may. We are all, when we testify, doing so on the basis of the best information available to us at the time, 
as scientists. The notion that one cannot be objective because one has concluded that a particular study by particular people was deeply flawed, and that was my conclusion from reading the study by Soon and Balayunas, that it was deeply flawed, and that has been the conclusion of the great bulk of the rest of the community. That being so, I cannot be expected to be unbiased as to the merit of that particular study. I am biased by study. I am biased by having read it, okay. studied it, okay. and understood what's wrong with and it. And I respect your opinion on that, but it seems to me that other people ought to look into this. Now, I want to ask you a question that you can answer yes or no. You're the science advisor to the President. And I would like to ask you to guarantee Congress that you will provide the public, including us, access to all documents prepared with government funding relating to science change, and that includes studies that the IPCC uh, has either gotten or utilized so that nobody can wiggle out of this by saying that the IPCC is exempt from this because they're an international body. Will you give us that information and then allow the public, including other scientists, to be able to see it? After all, the taxpayers have paid for it. I, I'm not sure what all you're asking, Congressman, but I am absolutely in support of the public and the taxpayers having access to the results of research that they pay for. The only uh, constraints on that are research classified for national security reasons or research that is incomplete. It is a problem where people insist on the release of data that scientists have not yet even finished assembling because this leads to interpretations immediately on the basis of an incomplete picture. But once research is complete and is published uh, in the peer-reviewed literature or is submitted as a report for use by government policymakers, I do believe that all of the data behind that, all of the methods, all of the analysis should be made available to the Congress, the public, the taxpayers, yes. You'll be getting a few letters from us to that effect. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, let me let me put up two charts here. The first chart is the is just a chart reflecting what Dr. Lubchenco and and you, uh, Dr. Holdren, have referred to, which is this uh, dramatic spike which has uh, uh, been created in uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, this seems to be an incontrovertible fact. No one actually denies this. It's measurable. Uh, and it correlates almost directly uh, with the industrialization of not only our country but Europe and increasingly in China and India as uh, the amount of CO2 emitted globally has increased. And in fact, in 2009, uh, the trend is that this will be a, a warmer year than last year was. And so where the spike is going back up again if all data up until the end of November uh, continues on for the concluding uh, month of that of this year. So we can see this trend, and it's gone unabated uh, since the rise of the industrial era. Now I'll show you another chart. This is a chart of the uh, number of home run hitters in, the, uh, in Major League Baseball uh, from 1920 until uh, today. Now the average was 3.3 uh, players uh, were averaging over 40 home runs per year from 1920 uh, until the 1990s which is why Ted Williams and Willie Mays and Babe Ruth were so famous that they could hit more than 40 home runs. Then all of a sudden, in the 1990s, there was a huge spike in the number of people hitting more than 40 home runs. Now, Major League Baseball said, well, you know, perhaps the players are getting stronger. Uh, others said, well, perhaps the baseballs are, are juiced. But once a steroid testing program was put in place over the last three years, an amazing thing has happened there was a precipitous drop in the number of 40 home run hitters back to normal levels. An artificial substance injected into players, a huge increase in the number of home runs, but once it was removed, we went back to normal levels, levels again. Now, some people were, of course, arguing that the new normal was people hitting more than 60 home runs and 70 home runs, huh? Well, uh, it turns out that the testing program brought it down dramatically. Once we dealt with the reality of the science of what was going on in baseball. Well, here we have the same trend, but we have yet to inject the solution. That is the reduction in the amount of CO2 being emitted by the United States, by Europe, uh, and uh, by other parts of the world. That is our challenge. It is incontrovertible. Artificial substance uh, put into uh, man or nature causes big differences. 
And so these spikes are very, very coincidental, huh? Now, there were deniers in Major League Baseball. They said, oh, no, steroids has nothing to do with it. And by the way, Major League Baseball wanted to go along with it in the same way that the coal industry, the oil industry, other fossil fuel industries want to go along with the myth that nothing really abnormal is happening. But the consensus of the science in the world, the National Academy of Sciences of every country in the world, is that this spike in CO2 is man-made, and that it is causing dramatic changes in our oceans, to our glaciers, in the Arctic, in the villages of Alaska that see their permafrost melting and their villages falling into uh, the ocean, and droughts being created around the world. And all of this evidence uh, is basically so massive that there's no way to avoid it. And so what the minority has decided to do, what the deniers, what the oil and coal industry want to do, uh, is to use uh, the few emails of a few people who are doubting this science, which is a consensus around the country, uh, as a way of trying to cast doubt the same way Major League Baseball did uh, on the undeniable correlation between the injection of these artificial sources into the atmosphere uh, are having on our planet. And so, you know, we can, we can continue uh, this, you know, uh, pretense, and we can use a small number of emails, I suppose, to have a larger debate. Um, but I think that it would be better for us to accept the science, uh, to accept this curve, uh, to basically deal with the reality that the minority has no answer for why it has spiked so dramatically, why it's going back up again this year. They sit over here using a couple of emails uh, as a reason why we should stop all efforts uh, to deal with this catastrophic threat to our planet. And so since no alternative theory has been presented, at least baseball said, well, the players are getting stronger. Huh? That was their answer. But everyone who was looking at it was saying, how can they be so much stronger than the players just five years ago? Well, that's the same thing that's happening with this CO2 trend. Okay? There is no explanation for it other than that it's man-made. And by the way, you can say, well, it's not that big. Huh? What's the difference? A, a degree or two. Huh? Well, a kid has a temperature of 98.6 normally. Well, you add a couple of degrees temperature uh, to that child, and they're at 100.6. The doctor says, well, you know, you've been at that new normal for um, 14 days now, uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, Ma'am, your son Joey, he's going to be fine. The new normal is 100.6. Well, who would ever accept that as an answer because there was only a two-degree change in the child? Huh? Well, that's what we've got here for the planet. A two-degree change in the overall temperature of our planet is just as catastrophic as it would be for a small child who would receive no medical attention because the doctor had concluded, or a small number of doctors would say, the child can live with the new normal of two degrees higher. Huh? What parent would ever run that risk uh, of not giving treatment to that child? Huh? And that's what we're talking about here. Yes, there's a normal temperature for the planet, but you add on two more degrees three more degrees, it is catastrophic. You know, you get the consensus, as Dr. Holdren is saying, that there is a six-foot rise uh, in the uh, sea level of our planet. That's not frightening enough for the other side. They want to know why it's not 11 feet anymore. Well, six feet has such catastrophic consequences for Alaska, for uh, the Everglades, for Boston, uh, for Cape Cod, for Southern California, uh, that it's almost unimaginable what the changes would have to take place in our country. Okay? So what's the answer? Again, we keep saying, what are you saying is the answer to why this is spiking so dramatically? Where's your evidence? Just by casting doubt with a few emails on a consensus globally and a century-wide study of this subject, well, is, yield. I will not yield at this time, is not, in, is not uh, going to deal with this issue, okay? These scientists are our best people in our country, and they are joined by thousands of others, not only here but across the world, in their construction of their analysis. There is no alternative theory that the minority is proposing, other than that which we know has been funded 
uh, by the oil and coal and other industries that want to continue business as usual. Now, we have tried to construct in the Waxman Market Bill an alternative way in which these issues could be dealt with. Uh, and they, of course, don't want to deal with that uh, issue uh, because they would prefer their denial. What I am going to say to you, uh, Dr. Holdren, if you could, um, is I would like you to go through the other points that you would like to make uh, in response to the questions that were raised by Mr. Sensenbrenner uh, in his yeah, opening question of you, which I have allowed all of the minority members to do so. And I, the, the, the courtesy I have extended to each minority member, I am going to extend to myself. Dr. Holdren. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think actually we got to the main points in the further discussion of sea level rise, and I wouldn't have anything uh, further I feel I need to add. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Holden, very much. Um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Sullivan, do you have any additional questions? You do not. Okay. Well, then um, uh, I will allow uh, um, any written questions that will be posed to the witnesses uh, to, uh, to uh, be made by members who are not here. Uh, we thank our two witnesses for their testimony here today. Uh, it is extremely valuable at this time in our planet's history uh, for the two of you to be working uh, for our country and for the world. Uh, it, um, it, it's an honor for us to have you here today. We thank you for your distinguished service. Uh, with that, uh, this hearing is the general, uh, the, the uh, Dr. Luchenko, would you like to be recognized? The, the general doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I especially appreciate the extra time to do this demonstration, and I might draw everyone's attention to sort of the final results of uh, the status of the chalk in the three different solutions, uh, just to bring the message would back you, to would an you important would, point. Would you summarize the status of the, of the, in the three jars? The chalk that is in the water only has not changed at all. The chalk that is in the half water, half vinegar uh, is dissolving, and the chalk that is in the total vinegar has dissolved quite substantially and will continue to do so. We thank the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the expert uh, testimony that we received today. Uh, again, there is a part of us that really needs to go back to uh, sophomore and junior year in high school uh, so that we can get a briefing once again uh, on, the, uh, on the essential uh, science uh, that, uh, uh, that affects our planet. Uh, we thank you for everything uh, that you have done here today with that this hearing. And we, and we thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we thank the committee. We, we thank